Okay guys, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to kind of go over your review in a video. You've got the online review sheet that you can print off and it breaks it down chapter by chapter. And I took that and put that in this PowerPoint here. Also, you have the Quizlet cards that should help you as well. So we're gonna kind of go through and hit kind of the high points of what you need to know for your um, final. So the main kind of comprehensive part that's going to actually kind of cover both semesters, and I know some of you haven't had Anatomy 1 with, with me, or it's maybe been a while, but the thing is, we do need to make sure by the end of this class that you do know what each body system does and the organs involved in each body system. So in your textbook on Table 1.2, um, pages 4 through 7, you have information on that. Also in the Quizlet cards, I've placed these as well. So it's important as you're going through there, like for the nervous system, you need to know that the nervous system coordinates body activities, um, that it receives and processes information, um, it stimulates electrical impulses through action potentials, and that it's made of the brain, spinal cord, and the nerves. So these are the kind of things that you're going to need to be able to know. And know that this test, though, is all multiple choice or matching, so there's no short answer. Also, there will be no pictures on the exam, so it's all going to be mostly in words. Um, I added the pictures in the Quizlet cards to show you the organs. That way I just didn't have to list them as well. Um, so you take your time and study each of these systems. And guys, it's the main thing that the system does, and I added those again in the Quizlet cards. But you have that also available in your textbook, Table 1.2 on pages 4 through 7. So now let's get started with the chapters we actually covered this semester. So you're going to notice that there's a kind of a correlation between your lab final and your lecture final because we did cover the similar information that's there. The first thing here when we're looking at the brain with chapter 14 is that you need to make sure that you know the major regions of the brain. That includes the brain stem, the cerebellum, the diencephalon and the cerebrum. And you should remember that some of these have parts to them. The brain stem contains the midbrain, the medulla, and the pons. Okay, so knowing that it has three structures. The diencephalon also has three structures. It has the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus, also known as the penile gland. The cere cerebellum is the second largest part of the brain, and it's the part that does posture, balance, um, helping you coordinate your movements, that sort of thing. The cerebrum is the biggest part of your brain, the largest part, and it's the part we normally think of when we think of the brain. Um, it has the lobes, remember things like frontal, parietal, temporal, um, occipital, but also this is your seat of higher intelligence. This is where we're going to do most of our processing for our sensations and be able to um, make more complex kind of decisions due to the fact that we have a cerebrum. So if we look at the functions, I've already hit on the cerebellum and the cerebrum, but go, let's go ahead and look at the hypothalamus and the thalamus. The thalamus is the relay station. Remember we talked about how it's like a switchboard where information is going to be coming in and it's going to be sent to the proper area, as well as information going back down being sent through the spinal cord. The hypothalamus, guys, is going to be mostly for homeostasis. When we say homeostasis, it's going to be that area that kind of has um, those set points for things like body temperature, thirst, hunger, um, even emotions, uh, pH, things like that. This hypothalamus is kind of going to be the one that processes these. And remember also the hypothalamus is directly linked in to the endocrine system, which deals with the hormones. Um, the medulla oblongata, if you'll recall, remember has all the, a lot of vital, vital centers. Um, it's connected to the spinal cord as well as the pons. Um, those vital centers are for the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, so they're really important. Um, they also have some centers like for vomiting, coughing, things like that. Um, the pons, if you'll recall, the pons is between the medulla and the midbrain, still part of the brain stem. But the pons is going to have those respiratory centers like the um, pneumotaxic and the apneustic that are going to kind of regulate breathing in a little bit different ways. Okay, but they still have a kind of regulatory um, type reflex structure with breathing. Now for the protection structures. Guys, there's a lot of structures in your brain that offer protection, besides the skull itself, obviously, with the bone with protection. But we also have the, the meninges. Remember, the meninges have three parts. They have the dura mater, the arachnoid space, and the pia mater. All three of those together are known as the meninges, and they're, again, more for a protective, tough covering 
for the brain tissue since it's so delicate. Um, also, then you have your cerebral spinal fluid. Remember, this is the fluid that kind of encompasses all the areas of the, all around the brain tissue and the spinal cord. It's there for nutrients to be passed back and forth as well as waste, but also it's there for cushion. Okay, it's kind of like because your brain's kind of floating in it, so it's going to help kind of cushion as well. Um, the last main protective structure we have in the brain, remember, is the blood-brain barrier. There's a barrier between the blood and the, and the brain tissue. So things cannot just freely pass from the blood to the brain. This helps protect, keep harmful substances out of the brain, like certain drugs and things like that, but also pathogens like certain bacteria and viruses, they can't gain access because they can't cross this barrier. All right, so these are the main things that you want to focus in and on in chapter 14. Now, staying with the kind of nervous system, we'll move on to chapter 16. Chapter 16 is the integrative function where we're kind of integrating everything we're learning about the brain and sensations and things like that and putting them together. So let's look at the sensory tracts first. With the sensory tracts, guys, you need to remember that there are three of them. There's the first order neurons, the second order neurons, and the third order neurons. These are all sensory tracks. Now their locations. The first order neuron is going to be the one that actually picks up the detection of the sensation. So it's out going to be in the tissues. It's a peripheral nerve. It's going to send the message to the spinal cord. Then you have the second order neuron. The second order neuron is located in the spinal cord. It's going to take the information that's been sent from the first order neuron and it's going to take it to the thalamus. Now remember the thalamus is the switchboard. It's going to send it where it needs to go and this is going to connect to the third order neuron. The third order neuron then it connects from the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex of the cerebrum. So if it's coming from your hand or from your knee or from your elbow, it's going to send it to the proper area so that it can be interpreted. And remember, first, second, and third neurons are all part of the sensory pathway. On the other hand, you have the motor tracks. With the motor tracks, guys, I just want you to know that there's upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. The upper motor neurons, of course, are located in your brain. They're the ones that are going to get the information of whatever sensation happened and going to send the message down for you to do something, to cause some sort of motor action. But this is going to travel from the brain down the spinal cord. They're going to talk to the lower motor neurons. The lower motor neurons are the neurons that leave the spinal cord and actually communicate with the muscle to allow for movement to take place. So they're actually going to be communicating either with the muscle or the gland to cause a change to happen. That's the lower motor neurons, okay? Now, the last little part here with integrated function is we need to look at the types of receptors. Now, some of these are very easy to know what they detect. So when you look at chemoreceptors, they are going to detect changes in chemicals. Okay, so they'll, they'll detect changes in like sodium, potassium, things like that, where you're looking at chemicals. Um, external receptors, these are going to be receptors that are going to receive information from kind of the external environment. Okay, these are found a lot of times like on your skin. Internal receptors, they're going to get information from your blood vessels and your internal organs, what we call your visceral organs. So they're going to come from the inside. Mechanoreceptors are going to um, be mechanical, so they're going to detect like movement, vibrations, things like that. Nociceptors, recall, are for pain, so anytime tissue gets damaged, they're going to send out the pain, recept uh, the pain signal so that those receptors can pick that up. Photoreceptors are for light, and they're only located in your eye. You also have proprioceptors. Proprioceptors, recall, will go with your muscles. They help you detect body position and knowing where your body is at any given time, like where your arm is, your leg is, and remember these guys are going to talk mostly to the cerebellum because that's going to be for posture and balance. We also have thermoreceptors which of course detect temperature. So again, some of these should be a lot easier to match up than the others. Um, focus on the ones that you have a harder time with here for chapter 16. All right, so now we're going to get into the special senses, and guys, we're going to focus mostly on the ear and the eye. I know that in this chapter as well we talked about taste and we talked about smell, um, but again, um, the structures are, are a lot more simpler than when we look at the eye or the ear. So we're going to focus on the eye and the ear. So with the eye, guys, you need to know what structures belong to the eye that are not accessory versus accessory. Remember, accessory structures are this normally just there to help the eye and mostly for protection. So these are things like your eyelids, your eyelashes, the lacrimal apparatus. If you recall, that's the one that makes the tears um, that we use. Um, also, when we're looking at this, um, your eyebrows, because remember your eyebrows help keep the sun, but they also help catch sweat, things like that. So those are your accessory structures of the eye. 
Now, for the parts that are functional for your eye, I'm not going to make you memorize or, or remember every little part, but there are some that are super important, like the lens. Remember that the lens of the eye is going to help focus the light. It's going to help focus the light back onto the retina so that you can see properly, all right? Because the retina, which is a little later in this list, remember the retina is the one that contains the sensory um, neurons, the rods and cones, which allows you to be able to see. Okay, so it's going to be able to uh, focus that light that comes in. Well, how does the light come in? The light is going to travel in through the pupil. The pupil is the hole in your eye that allows light to come in. Now, whether your pupil is going to be dilated or constricted is going to be controlled by your iris. Your iris is the colored part of your eye, which has muscles so that when it's bright outside, it can constrict in order to allow less light to come in. But when it's in dim light, it can dilate to allow more light to come in. Now, this brings us to the receptors in the eyes. I, just, I hinted at them when we talked about the retina. The retina is going to have these receptors, but guys, rods and cones do a little bit different things. Your rods are going to detect things in low light, and they're going to be more of that black and white kind of shadow shape type structures that they're detecting. Your cones are going to be your sharper vision and your color vision, right? So there is the difference between the rods and the cones, so make sure that you take a look at those. Now, moving on to the ear, guys, with the ear, um, of course, again, there's lots of different structures in the ear, but we're going to focus on certain ones. Um, the first one is the tympanic membrane. Remember that the tympanic membrane is your eardrum, and it's there to vibrate. As it vibrates, as sound hits it, it's going to then send the signals through the next structures, with those, which are the ossicles. Remember, the ossicles are the three tiny bones we, we talked about, the hammer, the anvil, and the stapes, those three tiny bones that go back and forth to allow vibrations to continue through the middle middle ear. Then you're going to see the vibrations continuing to the cochlea. The cochlea, recall, if you will recall, looks kind of like a snail shell. This is the part that's going to have fluid in it where the vibrations then get to travel through the fluid and move the hairs which are located in the organ of, the, of cordy. So when we talk about the organ of cordy, it's located in the cochlea and it's the hairs that are going to con get the sensations. These sensations are then going to be sent to the vestibular cochlear nerve. The vestibular cochlear nerve is the one that's actually going to send the action potentials. It's actually going to send the signal to the brain of what you're hearing. Okay. Also, though, recall that the vestibular cochlear nerve is cranial nerve 8, and it has two branches. The cochlear part is for the hearing, but the vestibular part is for equilibrium. So the semicircular canals that are listed here, they're the ones that are going to help you with equilibrium. So as you move your head from side to side, up and down or around, it's going to allow you to help keep your balance and send those signals through the same nerve. Okay. The vestibular side is for the balance. The cochlear side is for the hearing. All right, so now we're going to get into the endocrine system. And guys, with the endocrine system, um, just like with the nervous system, it's kind of integrated throughout the whole um, semester where we saw in almost every chapter there was a hormone that helped in some sort of system. So what we need to do is I kind of gave you a list of the hormones that you need to know. You need to know which glands secrete them, and you also need to know their main function. All right, as we go through these. All right, so if we're going to take a look first, we'll look at the antidiuretic hormone. Um, antidiuretic hormone a lot of times is abbreviated as ADH. Now, remember that ADH is going to decrease water loss um, by talking to your kidneys and telling your kidneys to actually hold on to the water. This is going to decrease urine production. Um, also recall that this is going to be... Um, made by the hypothalamus but released by the posterior pituitary gland because remember the posterior pituitary gland doesn't make hormones but it does release them and the antidiuretic hormone is one of those that it does release all right the next one's the adrenocorticotropic hormone this is also abbreviated as ACTH this hormone is released by the anterior pituitary, and its purpose is to stimulate the secretion of hormones by the adrenal cortex. So this is going to go and talk to the adrenal cortex and tell them to release their particular hormones in different situations. Aldosterone is going to be released by the adrenal cortex. It is also going to help with water retention in the kidneys. However, it's going to do it in a different way. Remember, aldosterone is going to make the kidneys hold on to salt, Na, sodium, which is then going to attract the water. So it does kind of the same thing as the antidiuretic hormone, but it does it in a different way. 
Then we see erythropoietine. Erythropoietine is actually released by the kidneys. Erythropoietine will go talk to the bone marrow, and it causes the bone marrow to start producing more red blood cells. That's the purpose of that particular hormone. Now, estrogen is also a lot of times linked with progesterone. Both of these are going to stimulate um, the female sex um, characteristics, but it's also going to help regulate the menstrual cycle. Um, it also um, will, the levels will change on estrogen depending on during the menstrual cycle when ovulation will take place versus when implantation of an egg happens, estrogen levels will change. But the whole point though is it's one of the female sex hormones that allows um, females to be able to develop secondary sex characteristics, but also to be able to have a more regulated menstrual cycle. The next one's glucagon. Glucagon is released by the pancreas. This is going to help with blood sugar as well, but instead of decreasing blood sugar like we see insulin do, it's going to increase blood sugar. Um, growth hormone is released by the anterior pituitary. Growth hormone does what it says it's going to do. It's going to cause growth, and this is going to mostly talk to your bones and your muscles to allow for growth through your body. Then you have insulin. Insulin is also released by the pancreas. Um, again, though, it deals with blood sugar, but its whole point is to lower blood sugar. So when your blood sugar is too high, insulin will be released to lower the blood sugar. We also see that we have luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone a lot of times is um, abbreviated as LH. When we look at luteinizing hormone, it's found when it's found in females, because it's in males and females, but in females it triggers ovulation and it stimulates the secretion of estrogen and progesterone. Okay, so it's going to help stimulate the secretion of estrogen and progesterone, but also cause ovulation. And it is released by the anterior pituitary. Now in males, it's also released by the anterior pituitary, but it stimulates the secretion of testosterone. Okay, so it's still going to cause the secretion of another hormone, but in males it's testosterone. We then see oxytocin. Its main function is going to be with females, and it's going to stimulate uterine contractions during labor and delivery, but it's also going to cause milk um, ejection or let down when um, breastfeeding is happening. It is produced, though, in the hypothalamus and released by the um, posterior pituitary. So again, it's one of those that's made by the hypothalamus but released by the posterior pituitary. We then see prolactin. Prolactin is released by the anterior pituitary, and prolactin stimulates the production and secretion of milk. And then last, guys, we have the thyroid hormones. Remember that there are two of them. There are T3 and T4. They are released by the thyroid. These are going to help regulate metabolic um, activities and rates. Um, with this, though, too, because they do metabolism, they're going to help regulate your um, thermostasis, like your um, temperature. They're also going to help with growth and development because, of course, if you're growing, your metabolic rate is going to need to increase. The last kind of thing I want to talk to you about with hormone actions is remember that hormones sometimes can't act alone or sometimes they um, counteract other hormones. So there's three terms we want to look at, antagonistic, permissive, and synergistic. So when we look at the permissive side, this is when a second hormone is actually going to enhance the function of the first. So a lot of times you would see this like with estrogen and progesterone or oxytocin and prolactin when you look at um, breastfeeding with milk. All right, so they're going to help each other. They're going to make the effects of one be better um, with the other one present. We also see that there's going to be a synergistic. This is when hormones work together. So one alone is not good enough. You actually need both to be there in order for it to take place, okay, in order for the action to happen. We also see that there's antagonistic. Now, if you remember, an antagonist is going to be somebody who is against the hero, like in a book. So when we look at an antagonist effect, this is when hormones have opposite effects. So one of the best examples of this is the glucagon and the insulin. Glucagon raises blood sugar, but insulin decreases blood sugar. All right, so these are just some examples of how the hormones sometimes can either work together or they can do opposite reactions. <clears throat> All right, so now moving on to the blood. When we look at blood, um, I need you to be able to ID blood typing based on the clumping, which you had to do in lab. Okay, you had to talk about this in lab. Um, remember when we do the blood typing, we use the anti-A, anti-B, and anti-D um, 
solutions. These are the antibodies against A, against B, and against our H. And so if they clump with A, that means the person has A blood. If they clump with B, that means they have B blood. If they clump with both A and B, they obviously have AB blood. But if there's no clumping at all, then there would be O blood. Okay, when you look at the anti-D, if it clumps, it's RH positive. If it doesn't clump, it's RH negative. Now, one thing to note with this, guys, if the person has A blood, okay, they have A blood, they are going to have the, the antibodies against B because they can't have the B blood. Remember, they can't be given the B blood in order to have like a transfusion, all right? So they'll have the antibodies for whatever the opposite is of whatever their blood type. Right now, recall though, if they are AB blood, they don't have antibodies against anything because they have A and they have B. But if they have O blood, they have antibodies against both A and B. All right, so that's kind of what we're talking about with blood typing um, as we go through there. Now, also, let's look at the functions of blood. Uh, blood has three main functions. The first is to transport, the second is to help regulate, and the third is to protect. Okay, so remember with transport, it's going to transport nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and waste. It's going to help regulate pH levels, um, and it's also going to protect by using the white blood cells. So now let's look at the function of the red blood cells. The red blood cells themselves, also known as erythrocytes, those are going to function in carrying oxygen and also carbon dioxide. So they're going to be really important in the gas exchange, okay, between the cells um, and also the lungs. Um, then white blood cells, if you recall white blood cells are also known as leukocytes. White blood cells are going to function in immunity. They're going to help protect us. However, some of these white blood cells are what we call phagocytes. They're going to be kind of like Pac-Man and they're going to eat or consume the um, foreign invader or the pathogen. So when we look at these that are the white blood cells that are phagocytes, if you look at this, neutrophils fall into this category, monocytes, which are also known as macrophages. Okay, so you have neutrophils, monocytes which also grow and mature into macrophages. Um, then you have your platelets. Guys, remember platelets are also known as thrombocytes. Okay, so when we look at platelets, their whole point is to help with blood clotting. They're to prevent bleeding, all right? So whenever there's a tear in the vein or the artery or there's tissue damage where blood, the blood vessels damage, it the platelets are going to be reactive in helping actually create a clot and close up that um, wound in order to stop the bleeding. Okay, so that is the function of the platelets. All right, moving on to the heart. Um, you do need to know the membrane that surrounds the heart. Remember, that's called the pericardium. The pericardium does have two layers. It has the visceral layer, which is up against the heart, and it has the parietal layer, which is up against the thoracic cavity. In between the two layers, guys, remember there is pericardial fluid. The whole point of the fluid is to help decrease friction, okay? So it's to help to decrease that friction. Um, you also need to know the chambers of the heart, um, which ones have oxygenated blood and which ones have deoxygenated blood. Remember that you have a right and a left atria, which are the top parts of the heart. You have a right and left ventricle, which are the bottom parts of the heart. Recall that the right side of the heart receives blood back from the body, which means it contains deoxygenated blood. It is then going to send that blood to the lungs where it picks up oxygen. So the left side of the heart is going to have the oxygenated blood because it's returned turning from the lungs and it's going to send that blood out to the rest of the body. Now these the, um, these chambers we're talking about with the atria and the ventricles, they are um, separated by valves. The function of the valves is to prevent backflow of the blood, to make sure blood moves in that one direction. Um, remember the tricuspid is between the right atria and the right ventricle. The bicuspid is between the left atria and the left ventricle. Remember that the pulmonary semilunar valve allows blood to leave the right ventricle and head to the lungs because pulmonary means lungs. And then the aortic semilunar valve is going to leave from the, allow blood to leave from the left ventricle into the aorta to go to the rest of the body. Now, there are some definitions that you need to know as well. So when we look at these definitions, you need to know cardio output. Cardio output, guys, is the volume of blood that gets ejected from the left ventricle into the aorta each minute. So it's the amount of blood, the volume, that gets pushed out of the left ventricle into the aorta every minute. 
So guys, when we look at stroke volume, stroke volume is going to affect the cardio output because stroke volume is how much blood fills up the area and stretches the ventricle before it contracts. So the more blood that enters and stretches the area, the more forceful the stroke volume is going to be, which means more blood will be forced, would, forced out of the ventricle, which is going to ultimately affect cardio output. Cardio output is also going to be affected by heart rate. The heart rate is how many beats per minute happens with the heart, which means how many times does that ventricle contract each minute, which again is talking about the whole idea of how many times blood gets sent into the aorta each minute, again affecting cardio output. Now remember that the heart rate can be controlled um, by the nervous system. Um, one of the main nerves, cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, remember is the wanderer. He wanders down into the heart and he can actually slow your heart rate down from the parasympathetic nervous system. All right, moving on to blood vessels. Blood vessels, guys, very basic, same things we kind of talked about in lab. Remember that arteries carry blood away from the heart. They also have a thicker structure, uh, more muscular, because they are going to be containing higher pressure because of the pump of the heart pumping the blood out into these arteries. Um, remember the veins are going to be returning to the heart. They're gonna return blood to the heart. And remember their structure is a little more floppy, but they also have some spe special structures called valves, which help push the blood back towards the heart. Um, recall that the capillaries connect the two. So if these are the arteries and these are the veins, they're gonna to come together in what we call capillary beds here in the middle so that they connect the two so that our blood can, stays in a continuous loop. Okay, it stays within vessels. So it goes from arteries to capillaries to veins. Okay, so that's what we're looking at there. Um, IDing blood vessels, guys, the main thing is kind of knowing where they're located. A lot of times the name is going to tell you, okay? Also remember arteries are moving away from the heart and veins are moving towards the heart. So if we look at the hepatic artery, that is going to be the artery that's carrying blood um, towards the liver, because remember hepatic means liver. The coronary artery is going to be supplying blood to the heart. Coronary means heart. The renal artery is obviously to the kidneys. The carotid arteries, remember, go and take blood up to your brain. Um, the hepatic portal vein, guys, just remember this is one that's a little different. This is the vein that's going to carry um, the nutrients that's been picked up by the small intestine, large intestine, stomach, um, all those areas of the digestive system and send them to the liver, okay? The liver, remember, gets the first choice and the hepatic portal vein carries it there. Now notice it is a vein though, so it's deoxygenated. This is not going to send oxygen to the liver, but it is going to send the nutrients. Um, the inferior vena cava is going to be the main vein that brings blood from the lower part of your body back to the heart. The superior vena cava is going to bring the blood um, from the upper part of your body back to the heart. You also have the aorta. The aorta is the main blood vessel that comes off of the left side of the heart. Um, that's going to branch and send the blood out to all regions of the body. Um, you also have the iliac vein. The iliac vein is going to be found in the growing, growing area up in like the hip. And remember it's a vein so it's returning blood back towards um, the heart, and also the jugular veins. The jugular veins are the veins that are going to be coming, the, taking the blood down from your head towards your superior vena cava. All right, so this is just to give you an idea, and again, their name should kind of hint to their location. Remember, arteries are moving away from the heart, veins are moving towards the heart. All right, so guys, when we are looking at the lymphatic system, remember the lymphatic system is also known as the immune system. Um, you need to be able to the ID the organs of the immune system, but again, we've already talked about this um, in the previous part of the um, PowerPoint whenever you look at the main organs that are part of it, but for the lymphatic system, remember they have lymphatic vessels, they have lymphatic tissues like lymph nodes, tonsils, adenoids, um, the spleen plays a role, the thymus, also prior patches which are part around your intestines, and also the red bone marrow because red bone marrow is going to help make the white blood cells which are part of immunity. Um, you also need to know the signs of inflammation. Remember there are four of them. You have redness, also known as erythema. You have the heat, 
okay, that comes off. Um, you also have swelling, that's edema, and then you have the pain. Now remember that the redness and the heat a lot of times are because we are shunting more blood to the area. So remember the blood carries heat and, the, and it's going to cause the area to become red. Also, whenever there's damage, it's going to cause the blood vessels to become a little more leaky, like they are, they're going to be vasodilated, so they'll leak and that's what causes the swelling. The extra fluid in the area pushes on the tissues, which causes the pain. So remember, those are the four cardinal signs of inflammation. Um, we also need to look at some definitions that deal with the immune system. Um, one is immunodeficiency. Um, so guys, when we look at a deficiency, that means you're lacking it, you're not, you don't have it. So this is where the immune system um, is not, does not have the ability to give you the proper protection. Now remember immunodeficiencies, you can be born with them. Those are congenital, um, where you're not born with an immune system, or you can acquire them later in life, like something with AIDS, okay, that's caused by the HIV virus. We also see autoimmune disease. When we look at the autoimmune disease, guys, this is where the body starts attacking itself. Okay, so when we're looking at autoimmune, this is when the body starts attacking itself. Okay, as we're going through that. Um, and we're not really sure sometimes why this happens. But some examples of like autoimmune diseases are like lupus, um, uh, MS. Um, we also see um, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that where all, all of a sudden the immune system starts attacking um, itself. And again, we're not really sure what the cause is, but it's not recognizing that, that those cells belong to you. Um, we also see allergy, guys. Allergies are caused by allergens. Um, these are antigens that induce an allergic reaction. So if you have an allergy against grass seed or, or a certain kind of weed, when you smell it or you inhale part of that, it causes your immune system to create an allergic response. If the um, allergy is strong enough, it could put you into anaphylactic shock, um, and that can lead to death. Um, the big thing that is with allergies, um, it's either avoid the allergen altogether. Sometimes they can give you shots to help desensitize. Um, if it's a severe enough allergy, then that's when I would carry an EpiPen for epinephrine. Um, also, when we talk about immunity, there's active versus passive immunity. When we look at active immunity, guys, this is when the antibodies are actively produced by the individual, like yourself. You have been exposed to whatever the disease is. So this would be like if you were exposed to chickenpox, you had chickenpox, you now have the antibodies against chickenpox because you actively had to fight the disease. On the other hand, when we look at passive immunity, this is when you're able to borrow the antibodies. It's temporary. It's only there while the antibodies are present, but this does not create memory cells, so your body will not remember them. Now remember, this is really important when we talked about the idea of um, a women who are RH negative, who have an RH positive baby, and they give that Rogam shot. It lets them borrow the antibodies that kills off the baby's RH positive blood, so then that way the mother's body doesn't remember it, and she can have subsequent pregnancies that can be successful. So this is when you're borrowing the antibodies. Babies will also borrow antibodies from their mother through breastfeeding, okay? They're not theirs, they only last for a short amount of time. <clears throat> Um, factors that affected the immune system. Guys, there's a lot of factors that can affect the immune system. Um, it could be like lack of sleep, stress. Um, we also see like certain hormones like um, cortisol, which is normally released when you are stressed. Um, it can affect the immune system and cause it to be depressed and not be able to work um, properly. Um, we also see sometimes even um, diet exercising, um, the whole idea of not having a healthy lifestyle like smoking, so that all that kind of stuff could ultimately affect the immune system. But one of the main things is kind of the stress because that releases different hormones which depresses the immune system um, and can cause those issues. Um, functions of the lymphatic system, again, this should be covered in the beginning. You should kind of know what the functions of the, immune, of the lymphatic or immune system is. But remember, it is to drain off extra um, fluids from between our tissues um, that get leaked out and the veins aren't able to recapture. It will return this to the blood eventually, okay, up here by the subclavian uh, vein. Um, it's also going to transport dietary fats. If you'll recall, there's the area that's called like the cistern that's around the 
intestines where it's going to pick up some dietary fats and take and send them into the blood through the lymphatic system and it does offer protection against foreign invaders again this is going to be for the whole idea of the white blood cells being present the lymph nodes are also there to help trap things and catch them so that the it gives the um, immune cells time to get there and fight off the problem okay so those are the basic functions of the lymphatic system all right, moving on to chapter 23, which is for the respiratory system. Um, with the respiratory system, there's a few of the structures you need to make sure you know what they do. Um, of course, you have your nose. The nose is gonna help you be able to draw in air, so it's part of the conducting system. Remember that the nose, though, since it is a mucous membrane and it has hairs, it's gonna help filter out the air, capture hopefully anything that you might have breathed in that should not get into your lungs. It also warms the air and moistens it as it heads down into the lungs. You then have the pharynx, now remember, if you'll recall, the pharynx is your throat and it is divided into three areas. You have the nasopharynx, which is close to your nose. You have the oropharynx, which is by your mouth. And then you have the laryngeal pharynx, which is by the larynx. Now your larynx, guys, is your voice box, okay? So that's what we're talking about there with the larynx. And then it branches down into the trachea. The trachea is also known as your windpipe. Now, guys, one thing to note is all of these structures listed right here, their function, the whole point is to conduct air down into to the lungs and to then move it out of the lungs. All right, they're there to help with the conducting part of the respiratory system. All right, the next thing that's talked about here is the direction of the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So it's important to know how we're going to be moving oxygen and carbon dioxide between different areas. So let's start in the lungs themselves. You breathe air in, so the alveoli are going to be high in oxygen, and the blood that's coming into your lungs are going to be low in oxygen. So oxygen is going to move from the alveoli of your lungs into the blood. Carbon dioxide is going to be high in the blood and low in the alveoli, so it's going to move from the blood to the alveoli. So they're opposite directions. That way when you breathe out, you're breathing out carbon dioxide. Now on the other hand, if we go to the tissues, these capillaries who have picked up oxygen now at the lungs are then going to go to the tissues. They are high in oxygen, but the tissues are low in oxygen. So the oxygen is going to move into the tissues. On the other hand, the tissues are high in carbon dioxide and the blood is low. So it's going to move into the blood. It's going to return back to the heart, which then will send it to the lungs and then the opposite will happen. So it's a constant exchange back and forth between oxygen and carbon dioxide. If you recall, your respiratory system is divided into an upper and lower section, and a lot of times we use this for like diseases, saying you have an upper respiratory infection or a lower respiratory infection. Your upper respiratory system is going to be anything above the larynx, so this includes your nose, your pharynx, your oil cavity, and any of those associated structures. Um, the lower respiratory system is going to be the lower respiratory system is going to be below the larynx, which is going to be the larynx, trachea, bronchii, and the lungs themselves. Now, we talked about earlier the function of the nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea were all for conducting the air in and out of the lungs. However, there is a place within the lungs where gas exchange actually happens. Now guys, remember this is the alveoli structures, those air sacs that are at the very end of those terminal bronchioles. Okay, so the very end where there's the air sacs, the alveoli are going to be covered with the capillaries and that's where gas exchange takes place. Um, the next thing on here is location of the rhythmicity center of your respiration. Guys, the rhythm of your respiration, the normal rhythm of respiration is found in the medulla. That's where the vital center is that keeps you breathing normally. However, remember if we need to, if we ended up like holding our breath or we start breathing faster, that's going to be controlled by the pons. Okay, so the pons will control any changes in that normal rhythm. But the rhythm is going to be set by the medulla. Um, the next part here is body systems that work together to regulate pH of your body fluids. Um, the respiratory system obviously does this, and we just talked about this in class on either Monday or Tuesday. So the respiratory system does this, but so does the urinary system. All right, so the urinary system is also going by regulating the pH of your body fluids. 
All right, so now moving on to the digestive system. Um, with the digestive system, guys, I want you to kind of look at the structure of the stomach. Remember, the structure of the stomach has its four regions. It has the cardera, the fundus, the body, and the pylorus, which is near the pyloric sphincter. But more importantly, guys, with the structure of the stomach, remember that it has a very unique um, structure called that rugae, and that rugae allows for the stomach to be able to descend, distend and stretch in order for food to be accommodated. Also remember too that the stomach acid is going to be a big part in digestion here, so there's a lot of mucosal cells which are going to produce mucus that protects the cells of the stomach lining. Now we also want to look at the function of several of the different structures that are part of the digestive system. So we're going to look at, um, so guys, the liver, remember, is the second largest organ that's in your body. Um, the liver does many functions for us. It detoxifies things that we consume and get, that get into our blood. Um, it's also going to remove um, bilirubin from the breaking down of old red blood cells. Um, it's also going to produce bile. It produces the bile. However, the bile is going to be stored in the gall gallbladder. So the gallbladder is just for storage and secretion of the bile. Um, remember that the bile is going to emulsify and help digest lipids. Okay. Um, the pancreas. The pancreas is going to be retroperitoneal. It's behind the peritoneum, that covering. Um, it's involved in the endocrine system because it does release the insulin and the glucagon, but its main role is actually in digestion. It releases a ton of enzymes into your intestines, which helps you digest not only carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and even um, nucleic acids. So it's going to um, do that, as well as sending out um, sodium bicarbonate, which is gonna help neutralize the stomach acid as the chyme, the material that comes from the stomach, enters into the small intestine. You also have your salivary glands. Your salivary glands are located in areas up here around your mouth. They are there to help create saliva. Saliva does have some enzymes that help start the digestive process, but it also helps emulsify your food in order for you to create a bolus to swallow. Now in the digestive system, your mouth is known as your buccal or oral cavity, and it's the site where you're gonna do ingestion, where you're actually going to put the food in your mouth and eat it, and that's what ingestion is for. Then we have the small intestine. The small intestine is going to continue with digesting um, a lot of those different structures like um, the uh, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and fats. However, its main purpose and why it's so long is to increase absorption of all of those pieces so that we can utilize those broken down pieces of the, of the proteins, of the sugars, in order that, to send them to our cells. So that's where most of the absorption is going to take place is in the small intestine. And then you have the large intestine. The large intestine is going to um, not do as much of the digestive part um, and breaking stuff down. However, there is bacteria that is here that can help finish digesting a few things and helping us absorb certain vitamins um, and minerals that are important. And that, that particular type of um, bacteria that's really important is E. coli. Um, but the point, too, of the large intestines is to help um, compact um, the, the food or the it's actually now the waste, to compact the waste and also reabsorb the water and get it ready to be eliminated from the body. Okay, so that's mostly what the large intestine is going to do. Now, how does the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system affect digestion? Well, if you recall, the parasympathetic system is the rest and digest, which means that when you are resting, the parasympathetic um, system is in control of your body, then your digestive system is going to work normally. It's going to cause all these different organs to secrete what they need, cause the movement of the food, and digestion is going to continue as normal. However, in the sympathetic nervous system, if it takes over control in a fight or flight situation, it's going to decrease these secretions, decrease decrease the movement of the food, so digestion is going to be slowed down. Now, it doesn't stop completely, but it is going to be slowed down greatly. All right, so now we're into the urinary system, chapter 26. Um, we got a couple of things we need to define. The first that we need to look at is urea. 
Guys, urea is the main waste product that the kidneys produce, okay? So that's one reason why we would get the word urine. It's mostly because it has mostly urea in it. Um, then we see that there's urine analysis. Urine analysis, guys, is where we're going to analyze the urine, and we're gonna look at a number of things. You're gonna look at the physical properties, like how it looks and how it smells, um, that sort of thing. But also we would look at the chemical properties. That's where we do like the dipsticks that we did in lab. Or we can also take it a step further and look at the microscopic part. Um, this would be important if you think that there's blood or white blood cells located in the urine. Okay, so it's analyzing the urine for different products that could be there. Um, this leads us to the function of certain um, organs that are in the um, urinary system. So guys, if you recall, guys, the kidney is the main um, functional part of the urinary system. The kidney is going to have those functional um, structures called nephrons. They're going to help filter out the blood and create the urea, create the urine. Um, they're also going to help regulate the blood based on the ion concentrations like moving sodium, potassium, chlorine, all those different things, even glucose. Um, it's going to regulate how much blood volume is there depending on if there's going to create more urine or less urine. Um, the kidneys are also going to um, regulate the blood pH. They're going to help be able to determine if it needs to help raise the pH or lower the pH of the blood. Okay, and we looked at that in this last chapter with chapter 27 when we were looking at the fluid acid base balances. Um, the ureters, guys, connect the kidneys to the bladder, so they're going to allow the urine to be moved from the kidneys to the bladder. The bladder is a temporary storage place for the urine. It also has a special structures like the stomach with the rugae so that it can distend and uh, be able to store um, the urine. And then you have the urethra, which is going to be the tube that allows the urine to exit the body. Now, difference between the male and female urinary systems. Um, the male's urinary system is connected to their reproductive system. That's the main thing. And also their urethra is a lot longer, okay? connecting to the bladder through the outside of the body, the urethra is a, a lot longer. However, in the female, the urinary system is going to be separate from the reproductive system, and the urethra is only about an inch and a half long, and so it's a lot shorter. So the distance from the bladder to the outside of the body is a lot shorter. Um, chapter 27 deals with fluid balances. Um, the big thing, knowing the largest component of the human body is actually water. Majority of your body is, is made up of water, just like the majority of our planet is made up of water. Um, you also need to be able to define dehydration. Dehydration is water loss um, greater than water gain. So this is where you're losing water faster than you are replacing the water. Um, we also want to look at some hormones. Um, so a lot of these hormones weren't talked about on the hormone chapter, but they are really important with some fluid uh, balances. Uh, the parathyroid hormone, calcicitrol, and calcitonin, they are all going to help regulate calcium blood levels. So depending on how much calcium is going to be in your blood is going to be determined by these hormones. Okay, And so some of these hormones are going to allow the calcium to be stored into the bone. Others are going to allow it to be um, taken out of the bone. Others are going to allow you to absorb it from your um, stomach. Um, but it could also when calcium levels get too high and they're not being stored, they could leave through the urine as well. Um, there are a few percentages or fractions of these fluids you do need to know, okay? And so this is one time where you're gonna need to know some numbers, okay? So when we look at some of these numbers, as we're going through here, the ICF, the intracellular fluid, makes up two-thirds of your body water. And remember, this is the cytoplasm or what we call the cytosol. The ECF is your extracellular fluid. Now the extracellular fluid makes up the other one-third, okay? So ICF is two-thirds, ECF is one-third. Now ECF is composed of plasma and interstitial fluid. So when we break down the extracellular fluid into plasma and interstitial fluid, the plasma makes up 20 percent and the interstitial fluid makes up 80 percent. So these are numbers you do need to know for your test. All right, last but not least is the reproductive system. Now, we are going to be covering this in, in class um, on your last day of class, um, but I want to go ahead again and hit on this for the final. So when you're looking at this, you need to look at the functions. Um, we're going to kind of separate them, male and female. So let's look at the functions of the male reproductive system first. 
seminiferous tubules. These are located in the testes, and this is going to be the site of sperm production. They're little tiny tubes that are located in the testes, and this is where sperm is going to be produced, okay? The epididymis, guys, is where the sperm is going to mature. In the epididymis, we're going to see that this is where the sperm gets nursed. They make sure that there's no issues with it, like a sperm having two tails or the head of the sperm not formed properly, things like that, where the sperm is going to mature. All right, so the vas deferens, I know I skipped it, but the vas deferens, guys, is the duct that connects the epididymis um, to empty into the ejaculatory duct, into the urethra. So when we look at these seminiferous tubules, that's where the sperm is made, the epididymis is where they mature, and the vas deferens is where they're going to be um, sent so that they can be ejected from the body. We also see that we have the serotorally cells. These um, are going to actually secrete inhibin. So when there is actually too much sperm that's being made and there's not enough room to continue making it, the serotorially cells will release inhibin um, and talk to the uh, pituitary gland and tell them to slow down on releasing certain hormones um, so that way that they can catch up on maturing the sperm. So that way it doesn't get kind of overcrowded. There's also Langding cells that are in here. The Langding cells are really important because they are going to release testosterone. <clears throat> we then see the structure of the penis. The penis, guys, is composed of three cylindrical masses. It has erectile tissue in it um, that surrounds the fibrous tissue. And this is going to be where, of course, urine is going to be released out of this area as well, but also where semen is going to be released during the reproductive um, um, process. Um, the testes, guys, the testes contain the seminiferous tubules. The testes, however, are located outside of the body, um, located in the sac called the scrotum. And the reason they're outside the body is, is because they actually um, need to be at a little bit lower body temperature in order for sperm to be produced um, more successfully. Okay, the warmer um, they are, they actually can inhibit sperm production. And so this is why they are located outside of the body. Now, before we get into the structures of the female, um, I'm going to kind of do a connection between the two where we're going to look at the site of fertilization. Um, once the semen has been injected into the female, that sperm has to travel and look for the egg. And if fertilization is going to take place, it's going to... It's going to take place in the fallopian tubes or also what are called the uterine tubes. Okay, that is where we're actually going to see fertilization take place. So now let's look at the structure and functions of the female reproductive system. So when we look at the ovaries, guys, the ovaries are considered the female gonads. Um, they're going to be the site of egg production. Um, so they're going to create oocytes, which is what we call eggs. Um, they are also going to be responsible for releasing estrogen and progesterone. Um, then you have the uterus. The uterus is a muscular structure. Um, this is going to be the site of implantation. So if an egg is fertilized, it will be implanted into um, the lining of the uterus. And this is where the fetus will de um, develop during pregnancy. Um, this uterus will also have a lining that if implantation does not take place, it has to be shed. And that shedding happens once a month normally. Um, then you have the fallopian, are also known as the uterine tubes. These are the connection between the ovary and the uterus. So this is where the ovary is going to release the egg into the fallopian tube, and then it's going to cause it to travel down into the uterus. Now the fallopian tube does have cilia in it, and so it's going to cause kind of like a movement of the egg down, okay, um, when we go through the process of ovulating and releasing the egg. Then you have the cervix. The cervix is the neck that connects the uterus to the vagina. The cervix is also what's going to have to dilate in order for a baby to be born during labor, labor and delivery. Um, and then you have the vagina. The vagina is located between the urinary bladder and the rectum in a female. Um, it serves as a passageway for the menstrual flow. Um, it also is going to be the area where sperm is received. And, um, and it forms the lower birth canal. So during childbirth, this is going to be the last place, of, of course, it dilates to allow the child to um, uh, leave the woman's body. All right, so that's what we're looking at there. Um, the next thing we want to look at, though, are the hormones. Um, the reproductive system, male and female, are directly linked to lots and lots of hormones. So when we're looking at these hormones, we want to see how they work both in males and females. And so the first one we want to look at is the LH, and this is called luteinizing hormone. In males, it stimulates the Langding cells um, to, to secrete testosterone. So this is going to allow them to secrete testosterone, which gives them more of their male secondary characteristics. In females, the luteinizing hormone is actually going to trigger 
ovulation. So it's going to trigger the release of the egg. Um, the next one is FSH. FSH. When we look at FSH, FSH is actually follicle stimulating hormone. So follicle stimulating hormone in females stimulates egg production, but also um, estrogen secretion. In males, it stimulates sperm production. And remember though that LH and FH, FSH are both released by the anterior pituitary. Now, we've already talked about estrogen um, and its role. Um, estrogen is really important in the whole menstrual cycle for females, um, but it is also important in the development and maintenance of the female reproductive structures, um, like the ovaries, um, the uterus, and all of that. It also increases protein anabolism and the building of strong bones in females. This is why when females go into menopause, they have a hard time and it actually um, can start weakening their bones because they stop producing estrogen. Um, it lowers women's blood cholesterol. Um, it also moderates the levels of estrogen in the blood, um, can be inhibited um, if they get to be too high or whatever. Um, so it can also decrease or increase the secretion of LH and FSH if needed. All right, so when we look at estrogen, there's actually a lot of roles. Now in males, they also have estrogen and estrogen can, um, does the same thing in males for the whole idea of um, building strong bones, um, but their levels don't drop drastically through their life, and this is why osteoporosis is not seen as often in males as it is females, because osteoporosis is the weakening of the bones, because during menopause, the female's levels drop to almost zero, whereas males level, the male level of estrogen kind of stays constant throughout their life. We also see that we have GnRH. This is the gonadotropic releasing hormone. This is going to be um, released um, by the hypothalamus to tell the pituitary gland to actually start releasing the follicle stimulating hormone, uh, hormones and the um, luteinizing hormones. Um, this first gets released during puberty. Okay, it will continue to get released during the course of time when the, when a male and female are in. Um, able to do reproduction, um, but it does start being released during puberty. Um, the next thing we want to look at are phases in the menstrual cycle. Um, so when we look at the menstrual cycle, it is going to be a phase, and in class you're going to see that it's kind of like a chart. You're going to see that hormones go up and down during different times, as well as there's going to be differences in the uterus and what's happening in the uterus during these different times of the menstrual cycle. So when we look at a, the menstrual phase, this is the phase of the menstrual cycle where the uterine lining, or what we call the endometrium, is shed. Um, it's discharged blood, tissue, fluid, and mucus, um, as well as epithelial tissue that leaves the woman's body, okay? And so this is what we would call their period. It's their menstrual phase. Okay, we also see that there's a pre-ovulatory phase. Pre means before. Um, ovulatory means ovulation. So when we look at the pre-ovulatory phase, this is going to happen um, before the egg is released. So it's also known as the ovarian phase. Um, it's between the end of the menstruation, the release of the menstrual um, phase um, and the beginning of ovulation. So it's a kind of a connection where we're going to start rebuilding part of the uterus and, and we're going to start maturing the egg ready for ovulation. Um, we also see that if we have the proliferative phase, this is the uterine phase where um, the thickness of the endometrium starts to double. So we are actually preparing for potential implantation if an egg is fertilized and so that layer is going to double. It's going to be full of blood vessels and blood so that it can um, help nurture that developing egg because the umbilical cord doesn't just automatically form, okay? So the egg has to have a way to get nutrients and the proliferative phase helps with that. Then you have the post-ovulatory phase. Um, this is the most constant in duration, like how long it lasts. Um, it's from days normally 15 to 28 um, in a 28-day cycle. Some women have a 28-day cycle. Some women have a 32-day cycle. It's just different. Um, this is the time between ovulation and the onset of the next menstrual period. This is going to be where ovulation has already occurred. The egg has been released. Okay, and so when we look at this, this is also a lot of times called the luteal phase. Um, this is going to be where estrogen and progesterone levels are secreted in very large quantities. And the whole point of that is because it's getting ready just in case that egg is fertilized. If the egg is fertilized, it will occur during this post ovulatory phase. And if implantation um, takes place, then it stops this kind of cycle so that the menstrual phase does not come next. It then continues 
continues on with pregnancy. However, if the egg does not get fertilized at the end of this particular phase, then the menstrual phase takes over and the cycle starts over again for the next month. Okay. Um, the next one is IDing sexually transmitted diseases. A lot of times these are not called sexually transmitted diseases anymore. They're called sexually transmitted infections. Um, but guys, there's a lot of different ones that we could talk about. There's genital herpes, genital warts, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. Um, there's just a list that kind of goes on and on. Um, I believe if you would look at this when you do a multiple choice question, you should easily be able to pick out which ones are STDs and which ones are not, okay? Um, we also then have some definitions. These are gonna deal mostly kind of with pregnancy except for Menarche. Menarche, guys, is the first menses. That's, the, that's when they, um, the young woman goes through her first menstrual cycle. So that's when the first period starts. We call that the menarche. Um, a zygote, guys, is a fertilized egg. This is when the egg and sperm fuse to create that first cell. We call it a zygote. Um, the next one's the placenta. The placenta is a temporary organ that develops during pregnancy, and the placenta is going to be used to help nurture the baby and give the connection between the mom's body and the baby's body so that there is that diffusion of nutrients and waste back and forth. Um, the umbilical cord is connected to the placenta on one end, and it's connected to the child on the other end, which eventually when we cut that off and it and it heals, it becomes our belly button. So the umbilical cord is that connection between the placenta and the growing embryo, the growing baby, all right? And so this covers um, your review. I hope this helps um, you go over the different um, chapters, kind of focusing in on what's gonna be most important. But guys, remember, there's a lot of information you learned here. I can't test you over everything. M most of the information we covered is obviously important. Okay, and I'm hoping throughout the semester you didn't just pump it in and cram it in for tests and dump it because if you're going to go into any kind of medical field, this is stuff that you hopefully will be able to recall and remember. Um, so I hope that this helps with studying along with your Quizlet cards and the actual physical review. Uh, please take the time to do them, view the video, that sort of thing. The more you study and the earlier you start, of course, the uh, better you're going to do on the exam. Um, so good luck, and if you have any questions, please contact me.